Kaleem, could you not for once just do what I ask you to do? Imagine me sitting across from Kaleem on a small child-sized blue plastic chair. I'm nine, he's 20, or I'm nine. He's nine, I'm 27. We sit in my small, colorful classroom, breathing in the scent of pencil shavings and construction paper. And he's sitting at the table, eye to eye with me, having not done what he was supposed to be doing for about half an hour. And he's looking at me with lividity in his eyes, and in the next 30 seconds, he will tell me what he thinks about my request. But first, I have to tell you about when I first met Kaleem. I was teaching in a poor rural elementary school in North Carolina, and each morning as I drove in to North Graham Elementary, I tried to get as hyped up as possible, because in my first year of teaching, I learned that no day would ever go the way I thought it would, so I had to be ready. So as I pulled up, I took a big swig of coffee and put on my best, I'm ready to do this face, and walked into our school. And although we had a pretty low budget, our principal was very creative and made sure we had a very welcoming entryway. So there were big uh, tubes filled with baubles that the kids would put in, uh, like points in Harry Potter every time they did something good. And we had a big fish tank with silvery angelfish. So I turned toward my classroom, passing our gym with its disintegrating linoleum floor, and put my stuff down and rushed up to Caroline to welcome the kids to school, which was my morning duty. And Caroline sort of gives you a sense of the dynamic of our school. A uh, few Honda Odysseys would pull up, but mostly ancient two-door Honda Civics and Oldsmobiles filled with uh, bunches of kids and cigarette smoke. Uh, but at the same time, we would usually be dancing because our music teacher would be playing the tambourine to our unofficial school theme song that year, which was Happy by Pharrell. So we're all dancing and welcoming the kids to school. So I was in a pretty good mood by the time I got to my first reading group. So I was a special ed teacher who specialized in small group, specialized curriculum. And so my first group was there and my principal comes by and says, I think we might have a new child with a disability this morning in the third grade. Uh, he seems to be struggling and I'm not sure, but maybe you can help. So after I finished my reading group, I ran over to the third grade hall to see what was up. I walked in and Kaleem is sitting five feet back from his desk with his arms tightly crossed over his uh, chest, and he's scowling at his new teacher. It's uh, 8 o'clock, bell rang at 7.15, so already it had been a pretty hard day for Kaleem. So I introduced myself and told the teacher that I'd be back once I knew more from his last school. It turns out, once I got the records, that uh, Kaleem had oppositional defiance disorder. If you don't know about ODD, it often presents as stubborn defiance to authority. And in my experience, uh, it seems an adaptation to a life where your own strengths sort of pale in, a, in contrast to the expectations of society, and defiance sometimes seems like your only avenue out. Uh, so in my experience, it's also an overused label for uh, black and brown children whose relationships have fallen apart, and instead of healing them, we blame them. But still, whether he had ODD or not, uh, the regular classroom was a difficult place for Kaleem and other kids like him. It was big and busy, and the expectations were high, and very frequently, kids and teachers would accidentally offend him, and he would get very upset. Uh, so instead, we went slow and were careful. And all the while, I monopolized any moment I had to build relationship with him. And I did my best to make sure he had more days where he left smiling than storming out. Two months later, though, I was getting to my last nerve. Kaleem had been with me most of the day for about a month because he had been too aggressive in the regular classroom. And on this particular morning, I'm sitting at my circle table in the teacher nook, uh, working with third graders on literacy, and Kaleem sitting at his own desk for a little bit, working on subtraction. And I can feel the anxiety of teachers sort of coming up into me as I'm sitting there listening to the short vowel sounds. Uh, I taught in North Carolina the year after the state legislated that any third grader who could not be shown to be proficient on a multiple choice test by the end of the year would fail the third grade, which was a horror for the children that I worked with. And uh, at the same time, we were coping with new common core standards, which meant the proficiency requirement had gone way up. And so the odds were stacked against us. And I would often think about this uh, while I was working. And it, I just say that to say that I had this aura around me sometimes of worry. 
uh, that sometimes was visible to my kids and made it easier t for them to push my buttons, especially when they were stressed out too. So anyways, I'm sitting there trying to keep my group focused on reading while the midday holiday of lunch approached. And uh, I sat in my nook and I could physically see that Colleen was starting to struggle with his work. In a couple of seconds, he started loudly banging his pencil on the edge of his desk. And normally I would have gone over and checked in with him or given him something different to do or invited him to my group. But for whatever reason, that day, I just wanted him to do his work, to learn what he could and let me finish with my group. And I was thinking, you know, he's struggling. The kids at my table are struggling. I'm struggling. And I, all I could think was, we're all struggling, Kaleem. Just try to finish the worksheet. And we finished our lesson, and my other students headed back to their homerooms. And I walked over to Kaleem's table, and I sat down next to him, and I said, coming back to the beginning of our story, Kaleem, could you not just for once do what I ask you to do? He looked at me as though I had betrayed him. And in the same moment, moment, shot up out of his chair and flipped his desk over with all his force. As the pencils and papers and books clattered to the floor and his chair landed on its side a few feet behind me, behind him, uh, we both just stood in shocked silence. I won't ever know what Colleen was thinking at that moment, but I imagine it was something like, who is this lady who was supposed to be helping me? And instead, she's ignoring me. Uh, now I'm probably going to get suspended, and my grandma's going to be mad again. And all because this lady, who was supposed to help me, abandoned me. Whatever he was thinking, he didn't move. He didn't escalate. He just stood, probably waiting to see if I was going to call the principal. And meanwhile, I felt a deep sadness and disappointment in myself. And all my frustration with Kaleem shifted back to me. How could I have asked Kaleem to do something to please me? That is not why I became a teacher. And I suddenly realized more deeply than before that despite all my training and my time with kids, I had no idea what I was doing. I had no idea how to go from this point in a way that would help him, to heal the hurt that brought him to that moment, to prevent the likely future that he had as a black boy with behavioral problems, to teach him how to read at a pace that the state would accept. I felt all the fears that I had about teaching and poverty and racism and depleted school budgets and ridiculous laws come down around me the moment before he flipped that table. And so instead, in that moment, when he was coping with a complex and seemingly insurmountable struggle, I distilled it down, wrongly, to the basic expectation, the contract between adults and children, compliance. So as the last paper floated to the ground, I did the only thing I felt was right. I apologized. Then I asked him if he wanted a hug. He said yes. We stood for a brief moment in my little classroom and shared a short hug that I'll never forget. We both cried a few tears as we picked up the table, the pencils, and the books. And in a few minutes, we just went to lunch. Ultimately, Kaleem didn't make it at North Graham Elementary, at least not in the short term. He became too aggressive in too many situations and needed more support healing his emotional self than our school could provide. He ended up transferring temporarily to the alternative school in our district. And though it was staffed by incredible special educators who I really respected, I was afraid that our failures, my failures, had been a significant stop on his road to what could be for him the school to prison pipeline. And I definitely know I felt like part of the problem, even when I was trying my best. I went to have lunch with Kaleem a few times uh, at the alternative school. I would walk in the basement entrance and down the hall to the sterile, pale yellow lunchroom. And despite the dismal decor, he seemed really happy. He seemed like he was okay there, that he felt safe and successful. He was at the alternative school for more than a year, and I was moving to Pennsylvania before he came back to our school. I don't really know what happened to him after that, but I think of him and pray for him frequently. I had learned through Kaleem and many other experiences at the public school that right now, too little caring might be going on in schools. I learned that I hadn't been taught, and maybe couldn't be taught, the skills I needed to help children with so many barriers. So when I had to move away from North Carolina, I sought out social work, a new or maybe not so new way of thinking about things. I admit that I lost touch with Kaleem after I left North Carolina, but I think of him and the handful of students I had like him uh, when I teach and research now as a social worker. Now I try to teach people to resist systems and interventions that make kids and parents want to or actually flip tables. 
I encourage people to develop a worldview that recognizes the myriad of reasons one might be justified to flip a table. Every time I amplify the voice of a parent or a student who has desperately felt like flipping a table but usually just soldiers on, I feel like I'm a little closer to the right thing. But sometimes I really wish we could just flip all the tables and start again. And when I feel like that, my mind goes back to that moment with Kaleem after he flipped his table. I learned in that moment what I know now, which is that although I will never know what I am doing, I have to do something. Thank you.